Hey guys, it is week 261. I got some reviews for you. It's right before Wasteland. I'll be going to Wasteland tomorrow. So if you see me, say hi, even though this will be put out way later. I guess this is for patrons. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the first one up is The Abandoned from 2006. This is one of the eight films to die for. It's nice to see these finally getting some Blu-ray releases, some re-releases out there. Um, this is directed by Nacho Cerda. Now, Nacho Cerda is kind of infamous in the underground extreme world um, for his movie Aftermath, which is probably one of the top two, three movies about necrophilia that's known. I guess you throw it in there with the necromantic movies and Lucker, uh, stuff like that. There's a handful of uh, necrophile movies. Um, but this is a nice fit for On Earth films. Um, I originally did not see this one on release. And I always heard that it was a spooky kind of adult ghost story. So Nacho Cerda, um, my first time I ever saw him, I think, was on the documentary or knew who he was. No, actually, I saw Aftermath when I was 13. Thank you, Marcus Cook, for the VHS tape recorded. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I did see that. I didn't really, wasn't familiar with the director himself until I saw the Belly of the Beast documentary that was on the uh, Dark Sky uh, two-disc set with all the Van Bever movies. That was a really cool doc. They had Richard Stanley and Kareem Hussein, who actually wrote this movie. So that's a connection right there. And Richard Stanley also worked on the movie. So all those people from that documentary are, a lot of them are involved with this movie here. That's where I originally heard of A Gun for Jennifer, which is one of my favorites too. So, so many cool, unique individual filmmakers in that documentary, and it kind of shaped some of the directors that I looked for and who I liked. So, uh, Abandoned. This is kind of interesting. There's a lot of special features on here. 50-minute interviews with like Kareem Hussein and Nacho Serta, um, uh, Zoe. Zoe, uh, she Hobo, Zobo with the shotgun does the comment. She's like on YouTube and stuff like that. She does the interviews. They're pretty good. But as far as the movie's concerned, this it takes place in Russia, but it's filmed in Bulgaria. Good, good double for Russia, from my understanding, at least from the Western Westerners' point of view, right? Uh, to us, we're like, oh, Eastern Europe, it all looks the same, you know? It's just a uh, Euro trip or something with our, our closed-mindedness, but that's just the way it is. So, this uh, woman, she's uh, about 41 years old. In the very beginning, we see these two babies can, like pulled up in a truck. This woman dies in a small village, and these people kind of obviously take the babies. We fast-forward 40 years later. And this woman, she seems to be a business type woman, has a daughter, a single mother. She gets kind of a phone call saying, you know what, we found your, uh, you have some inheritance. We didn't really know who your parents were for years. And she's very curious to figure this out. It's kind of haunted her her entire life. We have some opening narration that begin and close the film out. That's where the title comes from. Uh, so she goes to Russia to figure everything out. And she gets this ride across this uh, bridge. And it's kind of an isolated kind of island location. And she's supposed to own this house. Uh, uh, it's obviously been abandoned. It is a shell of what it is. She gets left there. She tries to get out of there as quick as she can. She falls in the water. Uh, pretty soon, another fella shows up, and he's claiming to be uh, her brother. And uh, you're thinking these are the two babies. Um, and they start to see some visions. They start to see these strange doppelgangers of themselves that look like they've been through hell. And they figure out that these are kind of just uh, warnings, you know, kind of herrings. Not warnings, but omens to show them what possibly will become of them. And as they figure it out, it's kind of a time loop kind of storyline here. They're called back here to, you know, relive something. And I don't want to spoil anything after that. Um, it's very gloomy and dark, of course. That's what the location would call for. And it fits the movie. It fits the tone. It's a very good tone piece, mood piece, ghost story. Um, there's a couple moments of extreme violence. It's nothing gratuitous. You know, when you think on Earth films, you think Nacho Cerda. When you see Aftermath or something like that, you're like, oh no. But, you know, Nacho Cerda, uh, you're just making a very adult ghost story. You're not to say that extremity in film is not adult. It can be very much so. But, Seeing this here is that he's making a very adult ghost story. And I like seeing the, you know, older characters. Isn't that funny when you watch a ghost story, The Shining, uh, Ghost Story, uh, Ghost Keeper? Almost any ghost story is more towards adults and, and less towards children. Unless you get to the points where you're talking about, you know, um, the innocence or something where the kids are directly in the story. But I'm just saying it's focused at the adults here. So we have these two characters trying to figure everything out. And as it progresses, we see these twists and turns. And I, I it's it's dark. It goes to places that are pretty dark. It doesn't pull back. It's not gratuitous, like I said, but it doesn't pull back in its plot and its storyline and showing you some really disturbing things. But there's a couple moments in here that are really great reveals, really clever touches. It's a well-written 
well-written ghost story. It's a well-acted ghost story. It's an adult story. Um, some people may be like, eh, it moves a little slow. I don't really think it does. I think that this film is very well-made. It looks really good. It sounds good. It's creepy. It's, uh, you know, I'm not the biggest ghost story fan, but when you do something different like The Abandon or The Others or something and you change it around or even No Roy, I really enjoy those movies. I think they're very good films. And ghost stories, it, I shouldn't say that. I don't like a certain ghost story from a certain time period, I think I'll say. Like, there was a time in the early 2000s when America was making some really bad ghost stories, some really cheap ones, and they were just all the same crap over and over again, or remakes of better movies. But as far as the special features are concerned, we have New Circling Back with Nacho Serda. This is 50 Minutes. He talks about some of his horror influences, how this movie got made. Circling Back with Kareem Hussein, who directed his own film, Subconscious Cruelty, La Bete, uh, La Bete Be Be La Beautiful Beast, and, and Ascension. I really liked his films, his directed films. I always thought they were great. He's a cinematographer now, works on bigger films. Uh, very good eye, of course. Circling Back with Richard Stanley, who did some write-ups on this and everything like that. Some writing and all that kind of stuff. Alternate cuts, alternate endings, deleted and extended scenes, outtakes, making of the abandoned and the abandoned's den, not your sir to the trial of death, little secrets, not your sir to. When Buck meets Serda, a dialogue between friends. I imagine that's Douglas Buck. Um, promotional gallery, who drew Douglas Buck obviously did. Um, he did that anthology that's really dark. Uh, family Portraits, um, which I think, uh, who put that out? Maybe that was on Earth as well, who put out Family Portraits. Who put that? Oh, that was Severin. Uh, disturbing film. Promotional gallery, storyboards, trailers. So it's loaded. If you're a fan of the film, then I would recommend picking this up. It is region A locked. And it's nice to see some of these movies from the early 2000s, which aren't my favorite time for films, but there are some real gems in there, especially when we get past like 2004. We have some 2005, 6, 7, 8, you know, some of those Dimension Extremes and shit and the French, you know, extreme movies coming in. I hope we get some American releases of those because, you know, I kind of cut my teeth on reviewing a lot of these movies and revisiting them or watching ones that I missed. It's kind of been refreshing and you know what? This is a good release and this is a good film and this is, um, like I said, an adult horror film. Uh, when the world's full of, you know, movies for kids and stuff like that, um, no, nothing wrong with that, but this is uh, one that you know, it's interesting. It, it does follow kind of a tropey storyline, like, oh, your inheritance, or this is a long lost house you you inherited. It's such a, a creepy, sad, weird moment to find, kind of confront your past and find out who you are, but uh, what will you lose in it, right? This is the band of good stuff. Next up, we have an MVD Rewind, uh, and this is Mean Guns with Christopher Lambert and Ice T. That's right. Gotta love the cast here. This is an Albert Pune movie. Uh, we all know Albert Pune directed a million movies. He directed like 50 movies. And the thing about Albert Pune is all his movies aren't great, but if you were to take the budget that Albert Pune got and the time that he got, all his movies in consideration would be great. And I hate saying that. In consideration, they are great. Um, but he, some some of the ones I really like, Nemesis is pretty cool. Um, he did Doll Man. He has a handful of other ones. Radioactive Dreams is one that I've always wanted to see. But uh, Cyborg is a cool film. So he has a lot of stuff that, you know, a lot of sci-fi fans. He's definitely a cult director. Um, he did, of course, Vicious Lips. So Mean Guns. It's not the first time he worked with Christopher Lambert or Ice-T. I think he worked with uh, Ice-T and Crazy Six. And Lambert, um, I think he worked with him before. So essentially this is like post-Tarantino, incredibly popular, you know, kind of uh, director at this time. So what happens is Ice-T is this kind of crime boss for the syndicate like this mysterious kind of a crime family. And we're introduced to all these kind of weird, crazy criminals right off the bat. Uh, Christopher Lambert is one of them, kind of a silent type. And a lot of other actors in here we have, of course, um, why is his name leaving me here? He's in a bunch of his films, of course. Um, geez, Tom Matthews. Uh, I love Tom Matthews. He's in here, and he's got like a buddy with him, an Asian actor, and they're a really good comic duo. Probably my favorite part of the movie, honestly. Um, so essentially all these criminals are called to this like a prison that's about to open the next day. In the very opening of the movie, there is a, a role in here. If anybody's ever seen Humanoids from the Deep from 1980, you guys know the boat scene where the guy's kid falls over the boat, and he's like, I need my kid. That guy's in here. And I was like, that guy looks awfully familiar. No, he's seeing Humanoids from the Deep 25 fucking times. And just, I was like, oh, that's him. That's the guy in the beginning of Humanoids, my favorite scene in that movie. But uh, yeah, he's in here. Uh, and anyways, Ice-T tells all these guys, there's like 50, 60 criminals, all kind of in different styles, all ridiculously you know, nonsense. Like, oh, there's a biker. There's all these kind of different kind of guys, and they never seen they kind of respawn as it as it progresses of course um all you guys have hurt the syndicate in some way here's your card you all have a card and uh all you guys gotta die or you know uh, there should be three of you by the end of it or 
you know, you all die. So Ice-T kind of kills a couple people, goes into there and starts watching the, the craziness ensue. Of course, everybody's turning on each other and killing each other. Um, the one thing is there's not really squibs here because this is like in a prison, so they couldn't really spill blood. Um, it does get repetitive because there's a lot of shit going on here and there. It's a little too long for what it is. I think it's like an hour and 50 minutes. And Yeah, it's an hour and four minutes, 104 minutes. So it, it does wear out its welcome a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Chris Flambert's all right in it. Ice-T's all right in it. But really, the guy who steals the show is, uh, let me find this actor's name here, Mike Halsey. I think he does the best job. I think he's a solid actor. I think he's fun. Tom Matthews is fun. Tom Matthews is always fun. Return of Living Dead, of course. Um, so, so you know what I mean? Like, it, it's a fun kind of uh, Tarantino kind of style in the way of Albert Pune. The action never stops. It almost never stops enough. It's enough to induce a headache. And it just is constant, you know. It's, a lot of people say, you know, it's a very much a bullet ballet, like in the in the way of John Woo or Sam Peckinpah or Quentin Tarantino. It's not as good as any of those because the budget, like, limited. And, like, after watching, like, if you were to watch like a John Woo movie and then put this in you'd be like oh shit no I mean but like John Woo was the best at that like if you watch Hard Boiled or The Killer you're just like oh my god this is just next level action like I don't think action's ever been done better honestly than Hard Boiled um, but there is a couple scenes you know going down the railing in this one as well um, it's a fun movie it's charming because you can just see Albert Pune doing this movie on almost zero money. And they use a Mamba soundtrack the entire thing because Ice-T's got a thing for Mamba. Ice-T always plays kind of quirky characters. You know, you think Leprechaun on the Hood, he's got he's a bizarre character, silly character. Ice-T is such a strange actor. He's in such great films like Trespass. And then he'll be in like Leprechaun in the Hood. And you're like, what the fuck? And then he's in like the CSI show. And he's just like, you know, he's a strange actor. Um, some good, some bad. Uh, he's always okay to good. You know, he's never like, oh, Ice-T's ruining this movie. I mean, surviving the game, he's great in that movie. That movie has a great cast, too. But uh, this one's fun. Uh, a little too long for what it is, but the ending, I like the ending. I think it redeems the film quite a bit. Also, we have a, uh, one of the actresses is in here from The Warriors. You'll recognize her right away. Um, but yeah, it's a fun movie. Uh, there are some special features, of course. We have, of course, audio commentary by director Albert Pune. He's passed away since R.I.P. Um, introduction by director Albert Pune. New interview with producer Gary Schulmer. A uh, new interview with executive producer Paul Rosenbaum. New interview with composer Anthony Rapalti. And they talk about working with Albert, and they seem to have a lot of affinity for him, especially the composer talking about making these movies and being rushed. He's like, you can do it, man. You can do it. You can do it. And, um, you know, he's a guy that um, I think I like him better than a lot of his movies, which makes me like his movies. That's similar to like a Jess Franco. Jess Franco's movies, there's a lot to love, but the more you dig into somebody's filmography and hear people talk about them, it happened with Fulci. Fulci's my second favorite director. Like, I love his films, but the more you learn about Fulci, you're just like, I just, or, or how interesting he was. I know he's not a great person all the time, but you just kind of fall in love with his films even more. You know, or or somebody like that, or Romero, or Fulci, or and then even like on the lower level, like I'm saying, Jess Franco, Joe D'Amato, John Roland, like these people are characters, and I know they would say they have like a cult of personality, and Albert Pune kind of has that. You know, he's kind of special in a way, and I. I I, I see that, and I kind of like watching his movies, even if I don't enjoy everything. So this is uh, Mean Guns. This is one that they've been calling for for a while. And it, it's great to have it on uh, MVD release. Cool stuff. Okay, the next one's from Arrow Video. And this is, what, 1959, if I'm not mistaken? That's right. And this is the Scarface Mob. And this is the same story that the Untouchables book. You know, the Untouchables from... Uh, geez, what? How did I forget the guy's name in the Untouchables? The main guy. I'm going to have to really... Elliot Ness. Jeez, man. This is based off the same book, you know, that the Untouchables movie was made from the 80s. Directed by Brian De Palma with Kevin Costner and John Connery and whatnot. Andy Garcia and Robert De Niro. But this one was kind of made for tv at first in two parts but then they made it in the movie version i think it's the same uh everything's the same but this stars robert stack as elliot ness robert stack of course unsolved mysteries the infamous voice he's in other things like uncommon valor but he's got a great demeanor about him nobody does robert stack except robert stack you know what i mean he's got that great demeanor and everything like that and it's got neville brand and nobody does fucking Neville Brand like Neville Brand either, man. Uh, Neville Brand I know mostly from like later day films, like Without Warning, and of course, you know, Eating Alive, the Toby Hooper one, where he's just completely fucking unhinged. I see Neville Brand. I expect an unhinged performance, a great performance, but an unhinged performance. A WW2 vet, of course. And I love, uh, I, I really liked fucking Robert Stack in here, you know? It's so, so strange how they portray Elliot Ness in film. He was 26 years old during this whole time when he was going after the uh, uh, Al Capone mob boss and stuff. And he's always like kind of an older gentleman and stuff. But he's, like, he's so uptight a lot. You know, he's very matter of fact. Um, and, you know, having Kevin Costner was a good 
roll if that's what you're looking for in Robert Stack. Robert Stack, I actually, I'm going to say this, I prefer Robert Stack over Kevin Costner. Sorry, and the movies. I'm not saying they're better. I, whatever. I like I like this portrayal of Elliot Ness better. Um, as far as, you know, uh, it's kind of hard to beat De Niro, but Neville Brand's really great, too. So this is the story of the Untouchables. Oh, I should mention that uh, uh, Keenan wins in here, too. Steals the show. Steals the fucking movie. Joe, Joe Fazzetti. Joe Fazzetti, man. Joe fucking Fazzetti is so good in this movie. I love them in here. But uh, he makes the Untouchables. We have a whole team of guys, like eight, nine guys all around, different specialties. Of course, wiretaps and stuff. He's got. And, but uh, Joe Fazzetti was an ex-con. And they all work for, like, the government and everything like that. So, essentially, it's just them trying to infiltrate, you know, phone wire taps and, and breaking up all the illegal stuff. At first, you know, Al Capone's in prison, but when he gets out, you know, Scorchy's pissed. Um, and, and they start attacking. They try to bribe all these guys. And eventually, they do retaliate, and they kill some people that are close to Elliot Ness. And that's kind of the, the, the saddest stuff in here. But Neville Brand's great. There's uh, the round table scene where they're laughing just, like, nonstop, like it's a Dick Tracy movie, which is also a big, I'm a big fan favorite of that. But... I I thought this was great. I thought this was vastly entertaining. And I had just watched Mean Guns. So putting in Scarface Mob, you know, you see the Mean Guns, which has all the finesse and the weird editing and the Tarantino style like riffs. And it was so nice to watch a 50s movie afterwards. Not that there's anything wrong with either of them, but so nice to watch a 50s movie afterward because the story is all you need. It's straightforward. The acting is good. It's just everything. It was almost like it just kind of stripped everything down and it was just right there and it felt good. The story was good. I was intrigued. The story was enough to keep my attention. There was a plenty of story to go around. It's something that interests me, the bootleggers and all these kind of things. And I think, how fucked up is it that we used to fucking mail alcohol illegal, right? Can you imagine now? Um, yeah, probably could actually imagine now. I mean, this crazy. Everything's crazy now. But anyways, the Scarface Bob is great stuff. I love this thing. I watched this one again. But uh, here's the special features. Gangbusters, a brand new video essay on the film and career of director Paul Carson by film critic David Carnes. Philip Kemp on the Scarface Mob. Um, they talk about Philip Carnes too and they mention they compare him to uh, Don Siegel who I believe they mentioned you know, Don Siegel is kind of this liberal guy that makes conservative kind of films. And they talk about David Carnes in the same breath. Philip Kemp on the Scarface Mob, a brand new video essay on uh, the career of Elliot Ness's depictions on film, including the Scarface Mob by film critic Philip Kemp. I, I like this. I thought this was good because they mentioned what actually happened to Elliot Ness and his life and all these things. And we have the trailer, Galaxy, and then we have photos provided by the Scarface Mob and the Untouchables archivist Kelly Lynch. No, this is good stuff. And there's some other stuff inside the thing as well. Uh, pleasant surprise. I enjoy these kind of things. I'm a big crime fan, history fan, especially when there's a crime involved. I like all these kind of people like you know al capone in film and dillinger and shit i eat that stuff up i'm a big fan of it and i like the old west stuff too i love it i love uh the, the violent history of america and other countries as well so scarface mob good stuff okay next up is when a stranger calls from 1979 this is the um second sight edition which also comes with the sequel when a stranger calls back from 93 so we're going to talk about the first one from 79 what was the director's name fred walton he did both films you know i was looking through some things and i was just like you know Going through 80s and stuff, I want to throw in some blind spots. I had never seen When a Stranger Calls. It was a movie that I'd heard about for years. I knew the opening. Have you checked the children? Of course, I've heard it a million times. I know the story. I know everything about the movie. It's just one that I never saw. This stars Carol Kane and, of course, Charles During. Man, Charles During is, is great. How good is Charles During? Speaking of World War II, I talked about Neville Brand. Charles During was a very decorated war hero. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I heard that mentioned before, and I was like, yeah, I'll double check on all that. You know, I'm a big fan of him in Dark Knight of the Scarecrow and Sisters and almost everything. He pops up, and he's very good, very charming. So uh, he's great in this. So, anyways, the opening of this movie, the 15 minutes or so, we have Carol Kane as a babysitter, and the children are upstairs sleeping, and she starts getting these really crazy phone calls. You can go back to you know Black Christmas from '74, five years prior. That stuff is truly amazing in Black Christmas. It works really well here and When a Stranger Calls, it's based off a of short, like I said, the same director. And what happens is, you know, the guy says, have you checked the children? And eventually, um, she realizes that um, the, the cops trace the call and, oh, it's, it's a classic kind of creepy pasta would be now, right? It's a creepy pasta equivalent back then. Oh, the kill, the calls are coming from the house. She escapes. She runs outside, runs into Charles During. We learn five years later that, maybe seven years later, the children were brutally murdered 
and the person was mentally ill from Britain, and uh, they escaped the mental institution, of course, and Carol Kane thinks that this person's out there eventually. That kind of plays into the end of the film. But for a while, we we kind of turn into this strange kind of police procedural deal thriller, where Charles During is now a private eye. He's no longer a police officer, and he's like friends with Ron O'Neill, Superfly. He's in this as a cop as well. And Charles During is hired by the parents of the kids who passed away who were murdered uh, to find this creep. And we follow this creep around the streets, and it's kind of like Maniac in a way, kind of like uh, Nightmares in a Damaged Brain, but a little before that, right? We kind of are following this creep, this unsettled, messed up person while he tries to interact with this woman, this barfly woman in this place called Torchies, which remind me of Walter Hill movies, right? Last night, Torchies is a, the bar in the Walter Hill movies, if I'm not mistaken. So, essentially, like, he starts stalking this woman. And Charles During leads on, and we kind of have this very police procedural of him trying to figure out who this guy is, where he's at, and everything like that. And eventually it leads back to Carol Kane. Um, this is a, it's a good film. Uh, the opening is great. Obviously, that's where the big horror set piece comes in. That's what everyone remembers. But um, if you're a Charles During fan or a Carol Kane fan, I remember she and Scrooge, I'll never forget her. But um, I think it's well worth your time, because During's really strong, and he's very good, and he's in it a lot. And the acting's really strong from the, the, the sociopath, too, the psychopath, the mentally ill guy. He's, he's good in here as well. And uh, it's just some really awkward and um, very uncomfortable kind of acting in this film from him. Uh, overall, I like this. And the soundtrack is what you remember. I've heard the sound cues and stuff reused for, like, the THX opening. If I'm, Not the movie, but, like, the opening when it's like, the sound effects and the opening and stuff like that. I feel like this soundtrack has been used, reused a lot. And it's very strong. It's very good. Overall, I thought it looked good. It sounded good on the second sight disc. And I enjoyed the film. It's a good film. It's not my absolute favorite. It's more... In the thriller vein than the horror vein, but it's definitely been an inspiration to many, many a horror film. Now we're going to talk about the sequel from 1993, same director, again starring Charles During, Carol Kane, and Jill Schoen. Gotta love Jill Schoen from Popcorn and a million other horror movies, Stepfather. She had a small little horror movie career, and uh, you know, she was always great. I, I always liked her, wish she was in more, um, I think, she's in cutting class as well if i'm not mistaken so jill Schoen is just one of these actresses who pops up in tons of things so this is when a stranger calls back 93 made for hbo um so essentially what happens is jill Schoen is babysitting in the opening and this scene is even i think it's kind of creepier in in a weird way to re kind of like perverse the opening of the first movie so it does something different but it works really well so there's a guy who comes to the door she's babysitting and says i need to use your phone will you let me in she won't do it of course and then uh she uh, you know starts to hear that there's something going on the guy keeps coming back to call the car club all this kind of shit's really confusing and something's not right and the guy starts saying someone's in the house someone's in the house uh it's really twisted and of course the, something happens to the kids five years later Joe Schoen's in school and she starts to notice things in her apartment are being moved things are being changed all these kind of things like that and she kind of goes to the police to tell them and everything like that they don't really buy it, but they send somebody from the college to help her out. It's Carol Kane, who now works at this college. She kind of helps students that have mental issues and counselors and all these kind of things like this. And she believes her. So she calls in Charles During to try to figure out what the hell is going on. They start to investigate, and they learn that the person who is responsible for this is a very strange individual with very strange talents, and it gets really weird. And overall, there's like a strip joint scene, which is kind of a like surprise, but it's HBO, so it's not a surprise. They're like, we need something in here. I definitely went with that. But I think Jill Schoen's really good in here. Um, Carol Kane's good. Charles During is always good. Um, but there's a scene in here where somebody is told to purchase a gun, and what they use that gun for, you're just like, shit. That would make you feel horrible. The end of the film, I think, is satisfying. It's creepy. It's weird. It's different. You know, it's one of these kind of early 90s bizarro films that you would see on cable and be like, what the fuck is this thing, man? What the fuck is it indeed? But it pays off. I think it's a good movie. I think it's just as good as the first one in its own weird-ass way, if that makes any sense. As far as the special features are concerned, we have... Uh, um, the new scan and restore original short of the baby the sitter directing um, a stranger interview with director Fred Walton Carol Kane on when a stranger calls Rotunda Alda on when a stranger calls I mean I haven't seen I didn't Rotunda Alda is one of these actresses you've seen a million times and didn't recognize scoring a stranger interview with composer Dana um, Capro uh, Caproff um, yeah, overall, I think this is a really nice release. I'm glad to have it, um, both of them together. I know that Screen Factory put out part two, and one has a kind of uh, Mill Creek release here, but this is a nice release. I had to have a nice release of these movies, and I'm super happy to have it. Both are good. I enjoyed them. All right, let's hop into those 1982 movies.
they know I'm human. And if you were all these things, then you'd just attack me right now. So some of you are still human. This thing doesn't want to show itself. It wants to hide inside an imitation. It'll fight if it has to. But it's vulnerable out in the open. If it takes us over, then it has no more enemies. Nobody left to kill it. And then it's one. That son of a bitch, you moved the cemetery, but you left the bodies to chest. You son of a bitch, you left the bodies and you only moved the headstones. You only moved the headstones. <laughs> What's in the basket? Stop it, there's no more time. You've got to stop. please stop it. Stop it now. Turn it off. Turn it off. Stop it. 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 Man, I'm gonna be kinda harsh on a lot of these here. So this one initially was listed as 82 when I started 1980 and through 1981. It recently changed to 1980. It went to the Cannes Film Festival, so now it's at 1980. And I already did 1980, so I'm doing it for 82. It's not going to make any lists, so it doesn't matter. But this is called Blood Bride, a.k.a. Death of a Nun. And this one starts off interesting enough. We have this kind of, um, you know, a confession by this guy, this strange British gentleman. And he's talking about all these weird things. And we kind of switch gears. We switch gears to this middle-aged woman who is very pretty. She's single. Her parents are pressing her. They're very Catholic. You know, the the, the dad is very kind of Italian Catholic seeming. Like, you got to find a nice man. How did they go? And he's the best part of the movie. He's interesting. He's funny. You know, but what happens is she's a secretary and she meets this British, that British gentleman from the beginning of the film and they kind of fall for each other um, and they decide to get married very quickly. He has some skeletons in the closet or maybe I should say library and um, they move into this big kind of isolated house. It's very cold, very damp and his parents are dead. The person who took care of him was a nun, Sister Mary. She's also passed and gone. He didn't say anything about it. But uh, as she starts to pry into it, she kind of does this bluebeard thing. I was like, that's the only room you can't go in is the library. She's, of course, going to go in there. She opens up, you know, uh, Pandora's box doing this. And she sees the nun, sees these strange pictures, sees all these bizarre things about him and his past. And she confronts him. And he eventually answers. But after that, it's not really the same. He starts to become more and more unhinged as it goes on. And she wants to escape. But it becomes kind of a trapped kind of deal here. Um, the whole movie is basically reveals of his sexual 
perversions because of this nun, because of his family, because of this whatnot and whatnot, and her trying to escape. It gets repetitive. I think if this was shot, you know, if this was a nice release where it's probably in its proper frame, hopefully widescreen, I believe, because it's, a, it's full screen when you watch it, when you all the additions you can watch, I think that it would be a little bit better. But for the most part, it's a dark film. It's not a very eventful film. I think this director went on to work with Brian De Palma. Overall, Blood Bride, a.k.a. Death of a Nun, is just very mediocre. It's not horrible. It's not great. The father is good. The lead is fine. The two leads are fine. But overall, it's just kind of a non-event horror film. It's not perfect. I like the perversity that go into his backstory, but by then you're kind of checked out. So overall, Blood Bride, Death of a Nun, it's just average. Okay, the next one here is Dark Sanity. Um, and this one has an AK title as well, I believe. I do not recall it. But Dark Sanity, I love that title. Uh, the VHS cover was pretty fun too. I think there's like a woman with a forked tongue. So um, this plot is one of these ones that's like, I barely remember what the hell is going on. Um, so this woman here, uh, she obviously has some mental issues. And her and her husband move into this new house. This house has some issues as well. And uh, one day she runs into Aldo Ray classic character actor you know alcoholic actor um and uh there's a funny moment where he stops her from drinking a beer and you're like i don't know about that but uh you know as somebody said the most uncomfortable thing about this movie is that seeing aldo ray in an alcohol anonymous meeting you're like oh fuck you that's horrible but uh so anyways uh aldo ray is trying to convince her about something this movie is bizarre and boring and it was very hard to get to and the editing is terrible the acting is pretty terrible i think that the editing makes the acting even worse to be honest because a lot of these people never went on to do more uh but there is literally a scene where aldo ray's in a car and he's talking so fucking slow and like they don't overlap each other's lines at all so he'll be like yeah and then there was a sunday cut was it cut what the fuck are you doing like, overlap that dialogue, cut those fast a little faster. Like, there's just so much fucking air in this. And, and like, this movie is, like, bad. The house looks cool. Um, overall, like, this is a, a movie that you watch, you turn around, and you go to talk about it, and you're like, I don't remember shit. I remember Aldo Ray. He seemed pretty drunk in it. It's not his finest work, of course. You know, he can do a good job. I've seen him in a lot of other movies where he's, you know kind of plastered out of his fucking mind or seemingly and the, the movies are better they do a better job even shock him dead when he's like the hot dog guy, like that the, 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 the stop hot dog guy like you're like that's a better movie um overall like i'm just saying i did not really care for dark sanity it, to me it's kind of a forgetful boring movie about uh you know kind of a house of psychotic women vein but you know i'm not a huge fan of it um i would pass on this one it's probably like a little less than than average um but it's not the worst it's just not great honestly as if it were happening right now the next one is an australian movie and this is from 1982 obviously as well and this has a title called um desolate angels aka fair game not to be confused with the 1986 australian film fair game or the 1996 american movie fair game with the baldwin um, so like the, the fair game is a, a really crazy title it's kind of like what was that fatal fatal something fatal uh love we had like six films from hong kong named fatal fucking love and you're like which one's which who knows um but uh so we have fair game here ah uh, this is not a very good film either uh very dull so essentially we have a group of three girls on their way to vacation. Um, they run across a trio of crazy jerks. Weirdos. Guys that are 30 acting like they're 10 year old perverted psychopaths i don't know what's going on so they have this road chase these guys don't like them they kind of uh end up uh going to the same little small town that they're at we see these guys assault this guy first you think it's going to be a gang rape and you're like what the fuck and then it's just an assault thankfully um so so what happens is that's the only time thankfully it was only an assault uh but what happens is these guys focus on these girls they focus they focus on these girls but they focus on these girls and start like tormenting them yada 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 there's also a side plot line where there's another person that's escaped in a small town and there's even another plot line where there's another creep out there kidnapping the girls so every guy in this movie is a pervert there's like five guys there's like five guys and like four women. That's the whole cast in the whole fucking movie. Everyone else seems to have disappeared from this small town. And you read this like little plot. They're like, these guys have taken over the town. You imagine it to be like a, a town full of crazy people. Like, oh, we're going to get like, you know, video violence or 2000 maniacs, a whole town of crazies. This is going to be cool. Or uh, what was the one by Alex Shandon? Uh, that was a fun movie, Inbred. Now, this is like three guys wandering around just like drinking beer and like farting and then just like 
uh, mildly assaulting people until they run into these girls and they start to try to rape them of course the girls fight back and they kill them in very uh you know mediocre ways the movie is very very run-of-the-mill very you know home invasion very decent mediocre boring doll film so I'm glad that I'm starting off with some of the doll ones, like three doll films in a row right here, because that will save me towards the end when I actually have like better films to watch. You know what I'm saying? Like I did that for 1981, and then at the end I was watching a lot of weird shit that was borderline horror, not horror at all, and then like a couple heavy hitters with the with a bunch of everybody else. But you know I'm watching some of the doll ones right now. I'm starting to get these movies that don't have a great reputation, that aren't super well known. Sometimes there'll be a hidden gem in there, but for the most part, Blood Bride. And then uh, Fair Game, which is this one, and the last one, Dark Sanity, are just kind of duds. They're kind of mediocre, like, right? For me, they're not really doing much for me. Uh, so, yeah, that's Fair Game. Okay, the next one here is a fucking gem, and I believe it's based on kind of a stage play. It was also made a couple other times. This is Brimstone and Treckle. This is more kind of a thriller kind of deal. It's not necessarily a horror film. It has some horror touches to it, for sure. And this stars um, Delham Elliott and Sting. And also the the, the female uh, mother in here, I can't think of female mother, the female mother in this film is actually from Drowning by Numbers, and she's in numerous movies, the, the Peter Greenaway film. She's excellent in that. She's really good in this too. But uh, what we have here is an older couple, and Delham Elliott, and I can't think of her name, um, and they have a crippled daughter. She is an uh, invalid. She, can't, she needs to be taken care of. She kind of rolls around and screams, and there was a tragic accident that happened to her. So Sting is this kind of weird drifter guy. And he is just bizarre. In the very beginning, you can tell he's kind of like this this shyster. He's trying to like uh, trick this old man. He walks up to him and says, oh, it's you. We know each other. And the guy's like, I don't fucking know you. Get away from me. So basically what happens is he runs into Delham Elliott and plays kind of the same deal. And Delham Elliott uh, plays along. He doesn't seem to know him, but he acts like he might. I was a friend with your daughter, yada, yada, whatever. And he doesn't know like that his, his daughter is crippled. So somehow he kind of merges in there. He either, Delham Elliott's wallet falls out or he pickpockets and whatnot. Uh, and he ends up showing up to the house a little later after faking an illness and everything like this. So he's there, hey, I'm here to deliver your wallet. The money's, of course, gone. Delham Elliott doesn't trust him right away, but he starts to kind of manipulate and get his way, work his way, work his magic with the, the you know, the matriarch of the family. She's burnt out. She's tired of taking care of her daughter by herself. And Sting says, oh, we were in love. I loved her. And he starts to manipulate it. It's really hard to watch in the best way. If you've ever seen films like that, where you're just like cringing for, for Sting's like complete lack of, he has a complete lack of shame and it, it's so perfect he's so great in this he's so creepy he's so unnerving and Delham Elliott in this movie is absolutely fantastic the way he snaps back and he changes in moods and is on happiness this is the best performance I've ever seen Delham Elliott do and I, I've seen him in stuff like he's in Transmutations which is not great but he's in some of the, the Amicus stuff and he, I think he's in a couple Hammer movies Delham Elliott's a classic actor he's in some of the Indiana Jones films he's a good actor he's a solid ass actor always oh, great he's in the Hammer House of Horrors Rude Awakening but I just think he's great, but he's never been better for me in this. I think he's absolutely fantastic, and he's just perfectly suited for this film. Um, and as it progresses, of course, we're going to learn some backstory about the family. Why that there's this kind of thing of what happened to the daughter, how the father plays into it, why he's so... He's so um, upset with his life and everything that happened but it's just really tremendous three th kind of four header acting here and it gets creepier and more unpleasant and uh yeah the ending's great uh there's a cameo by an actor i think a lot of people if you watch any british horror films you'll recognize him at the very end he's in a handful of them but uh overall this is a really great kind of almost it seems like a stage play here well acted and delham elliott kind of cursing you know god you know what kind of god would let this happen he's just going into this i sound like oliver reed i don't know it's not delham Oh, the Elm sounds, but uh, it's just great in it how he curses God and he and then he goes to work and writes these hymns and these kind of things for like cards for like religious people and death and all these kind of things. But um, it's shot really well too. Almost uh, in a lot of ways, the house is gorgeous and it's large, but it's dilapidated, falling apart. Think Crimson Peak, right? You see that big gorgeous house, but on the inside, it's falling apart, kind of like their marriage, kind of like their lives. You know, the house is falling to pieces. Uh, there's a lot of stuff like that. It's a beautiful looking film with the lighting and the shadows. Um, this is a gem. This is a great fucking movie. 
uh, watching this, it, it kind of revived my 82 watches so far. Uh, I, lo I loved it. This and Black Room, rewatching Black Room was a treat. You know, there's some good ones I've watched, of course, you know. I don't hate all of them that came out. But anyways, I, I really enjoyed uh, this one, Brimstone and Treckle. And I, there's an HD print floating around. This would be a fantastic release from Vinegar Syndrome or Severin or anybody, Arrow. Um, good stuff. And I know it's been done a couple times, but uh, Sting and Delham Elliott and the other lead actress here were all tremendous. And uh, just, I, I love love these movies that just give you that oh that cringy feeling when a character just has no shame and and you're just like it's so uncomfortable it's perfect okay now the patreon pick was pick clint eastwood movie i hadn't seen and i decided to pick one that he even directed here and this is play misty for me from 1971 uh stars of course clint eastwood and the actress Je jessica walter donna mills and it even has freaking don siegel in here don siegel has a nice little role in this film but uh you know this is one that i see parts of on television i don't think i ever saw the entirety of play misty for me that was a shame but uh yeah you know clint eastwood is a great actor great director i always love watching his work and he was never afraid to do things different, to put himself in a vulnerable situation. I just reviewed Beguiled a few weeks ago, and he put himself in some very vulnerable situations there. You know, and people always talk about James Conn and Misery. It's like, hey, well, you know, Eastwood's doing these things too, way before. And I'm not no disrespect to James Conn and Misery. That's a great movie, a great performance. And uh, but this one right here, you know, Clint Eastwood is playing this this disc jockey kind of guy and uh he does poetry and he comes in at night and uh dave is his name and he's really good at his job and he's kind of on the outs with his girlfriend longtime girlfriend she's kind of like been went away they're kind of in a separate separated thing and there's always this woman that calls in and says will you play misty for me so one day he goes to the bar that he always goes to he always talks about it on the radio and Don Siegel's the bartender, perfect bartender for, you know, Clint Eastwood movie. Uh, Don Siegel gave uh, him and Sergio Leone basically gave him his start in film. So, um, you know, Dirty Harry, Don Siegel, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, a million other great films. So uh, this woman is over in the corner and he picks her up and they go home and she says, you know, I do know who you are. I decided to go here because you talk about it. And they sleep together and right away she starts showing up and then she's not supposed to. And um, Eastwood's a little upset at first, but, you know, he kind of feels a little bad for her, you know, until his like, girlfriend comes back into town. And he's, he's, he's trying to repair these things, but this woman becomes infatuated with him, obsessed with him. She starts to not only ruin parts of his romantic life, but she starts to ruin his business life. And it becomes an absolute fucking nightmare dealing with her. Dealing with her insanity and her obsession and so many of these things. Uh, great performance by her for sure. She's amazing in here. She's scary as shit. But she becomes like this mad slasher almost at points. Um, there's a scene where she attacks somebody. A couple people. And they're done in the, the style of a horror film. They're, they're very scary. Um, but I, I like uh, everything about the movie. I think it's well made. I think it's well shot. I think the opening shot that gets Eastwood that comes in from the water is great. I think the ending shot that pulls away where we see somebody in the water is also great. I think those are great little bookends on the film. Um, there's a ton of features on here. The movie overall is great. Uh, it's well acted, well directed, really interesting story. Um, Eastwood putting himself in that situation was great. I can't remember who they originally wanted to play that role. It was somebody kind of bizarre that you're like, I don't know if that would work. But uh, they talk about a lot of it. There's tons of features on here. There's like an hour and a half like thing that somebody made uh, like that talks and breaks down everything. Audio commentary by film historian Tim Lucas. Interview with co-star Donna Mills. Video essay by film historian Howard S. Berger. That thing is a very long video essay. It's also very awesome. Play it again and look back at Play Misty for Me documentary. The Beguiled, Misty, Don, and Clint featurette. I believe that's also on the Beguiled release. Trails from Hell with Adam Rifkin. Stills montage. Clint Eastwood directs an axe photo montage. The evolution of a poster. Photo montage. Two TV spots. Theatrical teaser, trailer and teaser. So if you're a fan of this film, then I would highly recommend it. Um, it's super interesting the way that the character breaks down like Clint Eastwood. I mean, uh, uh, um, Berger breaks down his narcissism and all sorts of shit like that. But uh, I mean, it's got Berger and freaking Tim Lucas on there. How can you go wrong with this release? Looks good. Sounds good. Um, great movie. Uh, love Eastwood. Interesting stuff here. Good reveals, too. Um, enjoy it. Uh, definitely check it out. I mean, Eastwood, to me, I mean, like, I love almost everything I've seen him in or make. So, I mean, I'm obviously a fan, but I think most people will enjoy this one. Especially if you like Eastwood, but you're like, I'm not a big Western guy, you know. This one is more of a thriller. Maybe a little tinges of horror. So, check it out. Play Misty for me. Good name, too. Uh, before we get in these questions, comments, concerns, I wanted to show you. I completely forgot. I talked about this movie last week. I have a DVD of it, the the Fortune Star DVD of He Lives by Night. I, I do have a bunch of these Fortune Stars still. 
and then I didn't, I have never been upgraded. So, you know, I forgot to show that. I, I do have a, another one from 82. I'll probably show you guys too. But let's get in these questions. On uh, uh, Movie Junkie 84, nice. I feel like the last Slumber Party tends to get forgotten with the other Slumber Party Massacre movies and Sorority House Massacre. Fetish Magic, always put a smile on my face to see your sexy ass uploading a video, and this week was a doozy. Great reviews. Thank you. Uh, Subjective Perspective Collective, uh, out of the Every Boutique label, which is your favorite? Also, most underrated, great stuff, brothers, always. Probably Vinegar Syndrome or Severn. Or Arrow. I can't pick one. But most underrated? Kino puts out so much. It's got to be Kino or Mondo Macabro. There we go. Um, explosive Action. Thanks for reminding me about He Lives by Night. The 7-Up scene looks worth the price of entry alone. The DVD is going to be challenging to find, so hopefully 88 Films comes to rescue. I hope so. Um, Hudson3838. Hi, Dave. Uh, have you seen Poor Things? If yes, what do you think? If no, I would recommend. It's weird, funny, especially some of the stuff Emma Stone comes out with. Comes up with. She says what she's thinking, and Mark Ruffalo steals the movie, and Willem Dafoe nails it as usual. My favorite movie of the year so far. I need to check it out of here. Good things. Nick Mua from Belgium. Amicus really and truly were the best when it comes to horror anthologies, right? They're like, might, there might never be made. They, there might, like, misspelling here might never be made again i guess which is what you're saying i mean like how many companies out there were making more than one anthology I mean, like amicus is the only one that i can think of um so there we go city of the dead is fantastic feature indeed when i first saw it i did not see the twist coming even coming even though i'd seen psycho many many times by the point sir christopher lee was excellent with limited screen time as per usual and patricia uh just so acts the hell out of no less than two roles i take my pointy witch's hat from both of them questions are you for or against black and white cast uh, classics being colorized i'm not fond of the process i mean you don't have to watch it i mean now you're living dead didn't look great when they did that Tur turner colorized it so it is what it is. Um, would you ever participate in a panel about classic movies you don't like or care for? I'd love to see your top 10 for that category. I'd try not to be negative because if it's a bona fide classic 95% of the time, I'll come around to it eventually. Or there's just a certain like tropes that I don't like within the subgenre. And what it historically did is something that I'll focus on. There's movies that I didn't always love that I came around to. I really wouldn't want to participate in that. I think it's counterproductive. But hey, a lot of people do. So, I'd have that desk chair blessed by a priest. Clearly one of those pesky witches from Zindi the Dead put a hex on it. Seriously, see you next time. We can take care. Yeah, it's getting more beat up. Elk Vomit, question. I'm sure you bought a lot of turds in your lifetime when it comes to films you're looking to add to your collection. What do you do with the movies you absolutely didn't like? Do you keep them in the collection to keep it beefed up, or do you sell or pass it on to a friend? I keep them until I upgrade them, and the bad, bad ones I probably wouldn't upgrade, so they'll stay on DVD forever. Um, also, will you be picking up the Game of Clones box set from Severn Films? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. Depends. Ken Coakley. I know it's early, but I would like to give a 1982 top 10 as it had some good films from both in horror and non-horror. Horror. horror. 10, The Forest, 9, Madman. I count Madman as 81. Sometimes it changes, probably. 8, Tenebrae, 7, Amityville 2, The Possession, 6, Q, The Winged Serpent, 5, Pieces, 4, Midnight, 3, Friday 13th, Part 3, 2, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, and 1, The Thing. Too obvious? I mean, it's a great film. We all know that. Non-horror, The Amateur. John Savage plays a CIA analyst who trains to avenge his girlfriend who was killed in a terrorist attack. 9. Eating Roll. I love Paul Brotel and Mary Warnoff. Great movie. 8. Missing. Jack Lemmon and Sissy Spacek. Political thriller about two trying to find a loved one in Chile. 7. Hey, good looking. 6. Star Trek 2. Wrath of Khan. 5. First Blood. Um, 4. First Blood. He put it on there twice. I think that's a mistake. 3. The Road Warrior. 2. Diner. The cast alone was amazing. It was The Outsiders and an in that all the actors found later success and one pink floyd's the wall gotta love the wall and he says i'm a huge amicus fan i love the two doctor who movies as well as tales from the crypt and vault of horror tales had the better stories in my opinion even the stranger on the train bit had been done to death dr terror's house of horrors managed to make it work i believe that this is the only amicus film that christopher lee and peter cushing did together and they certainly make it count they work so well off each other and this one as they always did in the hammer films it's also funny seeing donald sutherland's clean cut young man in a suit and tie my only complaint was the dog being killed being an animal lover, I didn't appreciate that. Now on to the other Christopher Lee film, City of the Dead. Thus, this is one of my favorite Christopher Lee films. Being a native of Massachusetts, I like the town being an idiom for Salem. Like Lovecraft, a fellow mass hole, did with Dunwich. The black and white only adds to the atmosphere. Yeah, for sure. I can't imagine this movie in color. I, I don't think I'd want to do that. But uh, yeah, let's hop into this update. All right, let's get into this update. Kind of a quickie here from Kino. 
First up, we got the 4K of the Boogans. There is no escape. I look forward to watching this in 4K, 1981 movie. Man, this movie is uh, it's pretty cool. It's a little slow, but I bet in 4K it looks excellent. A lot of good scenery and caves and stuff. Good film. Then next up, we have Underworld by George Pavlo. Never been a huge fan of this film, but I'm willing to give it another chance. Uh, hell, speaking of Delham Elliott, there he is, Ingrid Pitt. So, I mean, it's got a good cast. I mean, I bet in 4K it's colorful and looks nice, finally. Kind of a precursor to Nightbreed. This is, of course, based on a Clive Barker book. Um, also, a.k.a. Transmutations. And then we have, uh, that's from the Kino Cult line, and this is Sinner. Uh, yeah, this is also uh, The Secret of Nymphomaniac, directed by Jess Franco, also from the Kino Cult line. This is just a Blu-ray, though. Uh, Going to buy all Franco, 1973. Then we have Privilege. Strange-looking movie here, the raw, shocking movie of a pop singer who makes it big. Paul Jones. This looks bizarre, and it was dirt cheap, so I grabbed it. Um, don't know much about it. This one here, um, this is uh, Guy Montag. Is that the director? Yeah, Guy Madden, Montag. Who the fuck is Montag? Um, Tales from the Gimli Hospital. Now, this is not always listed as a horror film, but um, I've seen it some places, and I was like, well, I'm going to check this out when I get to the, the late 80s. So, uh, Guy Madden, supposed to be an interesting director for sure. Oh, then we got a couple uh, Fernando Del Leo movies uh, from Rero. Loaded Guns. Yeah, Woody Strode on the cover there. Uh, got got a, an Ursula Andress. Got to love that. Um, this one I've never seen. 1975. Fernando Lake, King of the Euro crime film. Then we have Caliber 9. I do have this in the set here. This is a good movie if I remember correctly. Uh, but this is a 4K restoration. So it should be very fun. It's just the one that has... Uh, oh, geez. It's a, he's just running the entire fucking movie if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. But anyways, that's the update. Let's uh, get back to the video. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching, and as always, have a good one. Mm.